It's Wednesday, May 31st. The debt ceiling and budget cuts package heads toward House passage tonight after crossing a critical hurdle with President Biden expressing optimism. The deal he negotiated with Republican Speaker Kevin McCarthy will pass later in the evening and House Minority Leader Democrat Hakeem Jeffries urging Republicans to vote for their deal as most Democrats will. Without hesitation, reservation, or trepidation. Not because it's perfect, but in divided government, we of course cannot allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And President Biden did an incredibly good job under difficult circumstances in protecting some key priorities and values for the well-being of the American people. With debate underway, a final House roll call is expected this evening. The Congressional Budget Office says the debt ceiling deal includes Republican changes to food aid work requirements that will end up costing taxpayers money. House uh, Nevada Republican Governor Joe Lombardo signs a bill enshrining existing protections for out-of-state abortion patients and in-state providers, a rare occurrence of Republican governor approving measures that are part of the Democrats' agenda. A failed political candidate in New Mexico indicted on federal charges, including interference with the electoral process in connection with a series of drive-by shootings at the homes of state and local lawmakers and election workers in Albuquerque. The pool of Republican presidential nomination candidates swells as former Vice President Mike Pence will officially launch his widely expected campaign for the Republican nomination for president in Iowa next week, while former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie to launch his second campaign for the Republican nomination next week in New Hampshire. And consumer rights advocates call on state insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara to step in to prevent insurance provider State Farm from no longer offering new homeowners insurance policies to Californians. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, California, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. A number of drone strikes hit Russia overnight, including parts of Ukraine's Luhansk region, which Russia claims several people were declared dead. The overnight strikes come after at least eight drone strikes hit Moscow, damaging several buildings and injuring civilians. That followed Russia's targeting residential buildings in Ukraine with a wave of drone attacks in recent days. Meanwhile, today, President Joe Biden approved the new package of military aid for Ukraine that totals up to $300 million and includes additional munitions for drones and an array of other weapons. It comes as Russia has continued to hit Ukraine's capital and unmanned aircraft have targeted Moscow. U.S. officials have said there is no suggestion that U.S.-made drones or munitions were used in the Moscow strikes, which the Kremlin blamed on Ukraine, but Kiev has not acknowledged. The Biden administration has said it is made clear to Ukraine that U.S.-made weapons should not be used for attacks inside Russian territory. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby. We have communicated privately to the Ukrainians as recently as uh, last week or so uh, that we don't want to see U.S. supplied equipment used to strike inside Russia, that we don't support attacks inside Russia, and that we are not going to change our policy about not enabling or encouraging those attacks. Kirby said... Russian President Zelensky has given the U.S. assurances that the Ukrainians respect those concerns. 
The new aid package provides munitions to boost Ukraine's air defense capabilities to fend off Russia's air assaults on Kiev and other cities. To provide Ukraine with additional munitions for Patriot air defense systems, uh, which Ukraine has been deploying quite effectively, uh, as well as more Avenger air defense systems, Stinger anti-aircraft systems, and ammunition, of course, for the HIMARS artillery and anti-armor systems that the United States uh, continues to provide to Ukraine. Moscow was targeted by a rare drone attack yesterday that lightly damaged residential buildings. Russian officials say the West, which throughout the grinding war sought to keep the conflict from expanding beyond Ukraine, has not adequately condemned the attack on Russian soil. Ukrainian officials rejoiced over the drone attack, (laughs) but avoided claiming responsibility a response similar to what they have said after previous attacks on Russian territory. Including the latest aid package, the U.S. has committed more than $37.5 billion in weapons and other equipment to Ukraine since Russia attacked on February 24th of 2022. This latest package will be done under Presidential Drawdown Authority, which allows the Pentagon to take weapons from its own stocks and quickly ship them to Ukraine. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin cast the drone attack on Moscow as a Ukrainian attempt to intimidate its residents. He said Moscow's air defenses worked as expected, but admitted that protecting a huge city is a daunting task. His spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, clarified shortly afterwards. He meant that the system worked effectively, but there is room to improve its efficiency and work will continue to improve the air defense systems. That's what the president had in mind. Military watchers said the drones used in the attack were relatively crude and cheap, but could have a range of up to 620 miles. They predicted more could follow. Some of the drones seen flying toward Moscow were Ukrainian-made UJ-22s capable of carrying explosives. Others spotted in the skies near Moscow were small vehicles. Peace activists blocked the entrance to North America's largest arms fair in Ottawa, Canada today. Images show at least one person in handcuffs. Organizers say some 150 people blocked traffic with a 50-foot banner to protest the arms industry that has, quote, made record profits selling the weapons that have brought misery to millions from Peru to the Philippines, from Palestine to Ukraine. Another flare-up of tensions between the U.S. and China. China is defending the conduct of its fighter jet after it came close to contact with a U.S. jet over the South China Sea. The Biden administration released a video of the incident slamming the move as an aggressive maneuver. Chris Wood reports. The video was shot from inside the American plane's cockpit. It shows what the Pentagon says is a Chinese J-16 fighter cutting across its path on Friday, coming as close as 400 feet. A few seconds later, the US RC-135 shakes violently as it flies through the turbulent wake of the Chinese warplane. The U.S. Department of Defense says its plane was conducting safe and routine operations over the South China Sea in international airspace in accordance with international law. China claims most of the South China Sea as its own and much of the territorial waters of countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, but no international body recognizes that claim. China has, however, built military bases on reefs in the sea. And that's Chris Wood reporting. North Korea's attempt to put its first spy satellite into space has failed. Today's unsuccessful launch, a setback to leader Kim Jong-un's push to boost his military capabilities. After its unusually quick admission of failure, North Korea vowed to conduct a second launch after it learns what went wrong. It was Pyongyang's sixth attempt to launch a satellite, and its first since 2016. A satellite launched by North Korea is a violation of United Nations Security Council resolutions. 
Republican Governor Joe Lombardo of Nevada has signed a bill enshrining existing protections for out-of-state abortion patients and in-state providers. The move marks a rare occurrence of a Republican governor approving measures that are part of the Democrats' vow to make the western swing state an abortion safe haven. Donna Warder reports. Nevada Governor Joe Lombardo has signed into law protections for out-of-state women seeking abortions and the in-state providers who are assisting them. The legislation codifies an existing executive order from former Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak that bars state agencies from assisting in out-of-state investigations that could lead to the prosecution of abortion patients who travel to Nevada. It also ensures that medical boards and commissions that oversee medical licenses do not discipline or disqualify doctors who provide abortions. Lombardo describes himself as, quote, pro-life, but said on the campaign trail that he would respect the will of voters. I'm Donna Water. The Oklahoma Supreme Court has struck down a pair of laws that restricted abortion in the state, but the procedure will remain illegal in Oklahoma in most cases. In a 6-3 to three ruling today, the high court said the two bans are unconstitutional because they would require a medical emergency before a doctor could perform an abortion. The court says that language conflicts with a previous ruling it issued back in March. That ruling found the Oklahoma Constitution provides an inherent right of a pregnant woman to terminate a pregnancy when necessary to preserve her life. The two laws struck down today both include a civil enforcement mechanism that allowed citizens to sue someone who either performed or helped someone perform an abortion in Oklahoma. Human rights voices are calling attention to new North Dakota laws deemed hostile toward LGBTQ individuals, saying it's part of a movement led by national groups that does not align with how many Americans think we should be living together. Mike Moen has the story. The recent legislative session saw North Dakota and its GOP-led legislature take a big leap into so-called culture wars by passing laws such as one that bans gender-affirming care for transgender youth. Jeff Witroski of the Human Rights Campaign says in the U.S. there's been nearly 1,700 of these types of bills in the past decade. He says organizations such as the Family Policy Alliance are working hard to get them passed in conservative state houses. These organizations have a worldview that just does not comport with a pluralistic society where LGBTQ people are allowed to live freely and not be discriminated against. In 2021, a trio of these groups joined forces to fund policy efforts, citing the need to protect children's bodies and minds. Petrosky says they often have template legislation for lawmakers to use while pledging to help pay for legal costs if a state ends up facing a legal challenge. Local opponents of the movement say it runs counter to past arguments from those who decried the influence of outside groups in trying to craft North Dakota policy. In 2020, a proposed ballot initiative that aimed to bolster election access was criticized for the involvement of out-of-state groups. But Wachowski says these LGBTQ policy efforts are largely driven by organizations with addresses outside of North Dakota. He notes such groups also are active in backing candidates who are receptive to the movement. In the midterm elections last year, we tracked over $60 million in spending on attack ads that attack transgender folks. The bulk of those resources was spent in Republican primaries. Megan Langley is with the organization Strength in ND, which focuses on helping rural areas thrive. She says while her group isn't involved in these policy debates, she agrees with some sentiments that they can serve as a distraction. She feels North Dakota does better when the state looks inward to address more pressing issues. Some of the noise created during particular legislative times can take away from what's going on within communities, and it removes folks away from who their neighbors are. Groups such as the Family Policy Alliance could not be reached for comment. Mike Moen, Prairie News Service. California's Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tody Thurman, today hosted a discussion with state education leaders about promoting books in state schools that focus on inclusion. As many other states around the country pass laws that ban books, that discuss issues like race and gender identity. KVFA's Gilles Martel reports. 
A report from the writers' organization Pen America says book bans in the U.S. have increased by 28% in the first half of the 2022-2023 school year. According to the report, called Banned in USA, 30% of the nearly 1,500 books banned around the country this school year are about race, racism, or include characters of color, while 26% have LGBTQ plus characters or themes. State Superintendent Tony Thurmond says California hasn't had to deal with school book bans because California believes in teaching inclusion. Uh, inclusive education helps students to have great success. And it is for those reasons that I'm so proud of our tradition in this state of, of providing an ethnic studies graduation requirement um, and that we have training for educators to, to provide the best supports for our LGBTQ plus students. Pan America also highlighted what it called the misapplication of labels such as pornographic or indecent by activists and politicians who are looking for justifications to ban books they don't like for political reasons. Most of those book bans took place in Republican-run states. Cheryl Cotton is Deputy California Superintendent of Public Instruction. She says the California Department of Education did issue guidance to local school districts to help them protect students' rights to read books from a variety of different viewpoints. A student's First Amendment right to access of information is violated when school officials remove books from a library simply because they dislike the ideas contained in those books or seek to by their removal to prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, and other matters of opinion. Democratic Assemblyman Corey Jackson authored a bill that would require school boards to get approval from the State Board of Education before removing any books or classroom materials from school curricula. Um, AB 1078, uh, that was introduced and actually just got off the floor of the Assembly yesterday to establish that parents have the right for their children to have access to diverse books and curriculum that reflects the diversity of California. Recently, incidents involving Native Americans and Pacific Islander students being prevented from wearing tribal regalia during graduation ceremonies have taken place around the country. In Oklahoma this month, a Native American high school graduate shoot a Tulsa area school district claiming she was forced to remove a feather from her cap during the ceremony last spring. California school superintendent Tony Thurmond said he supports a new state law authored by assembly member James Ramos passed last year to protect students right to wear traditional clothes at graduations for KPFA news I'm Gilles Martel and you are listening to the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley KFCF in Fresno online at kpfa.org Voting in the House of Representatives has begun on a measure to fend off a devastating federal debt default The House of Representatives today holding a floor vote on the Compromise Fiscal Responsibility Act. Democrats had wanted a clean debt limit bill to prevent a financial catastrophe looming in June. Republicans had wanted a decade of budget cuts along with repeals of various Biden accomplishments in exchange for raising the debt limit. Leaders of both parties are now claiming victory. The voting will continue with a final roll call floor vote this evening and a Senate vote in the near future. Christopher Martinez reports. After all the shouting is over, the final result will probably be not all that different from a normal budget process when the minority party controls the House that begins the appropriations process. But this process was ugly, bitter, divisive, and it's still playing out. Lawmakers spoke Wednesday ahead of the crucial House floor vote, each side blasting the other while claiming victory for itself. Republican Garrett Graves of Louisiana spoke at a news conference Wednesday morning, saying House Republicans, in effect, beat the White House. It was a major miscalculation on their part. It is why they absolutely have tire tracks on them in this negotiation. It is why we absolutely ran over them in negotiations on about seven of their red lines. The position of Democratic leadership is that the compromise bill, well, could have been a lot worse. 
House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat from New York, also held a news conference ahead of the votes, saying, in divided government, we cannot allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. The original plan, as you know, 10 years of draconian spending caps in exchange for an 11 or 12 month suspension of the debt ceiling. Are you kidding me? Give us a break. That's what that that's that was their position. And that's not the resolution. He says President Joe Biden held the line, preventing harsh cuts to Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, veteran services, clean energy tax credits, and the environmental justice programs in the Inflation Reduction Act. And President Biden protected the American people from the types of devastating cuts proposed by right-wing extremists that would have hurt millions of everyday Americans. That was all accomplished as a result of this resolution. Compared to the original Republican proposal, the Compromise Fiscal Responsibility Act limits spending cuts to a cap through 2025, though the cuts still fall largely on the most vulnerable. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid were taken off the table, and work requirements for federal benefits were limited. And the debt limit? That was extended into 2025 crucially after the 2024 presidential elections. Catherine Clark of Massachusetts is the House Democratic whip. House Democrats are very clear. There is no perfect negotiation when you are the victims of extortion. Nobody likes to pay a ransom note, and that's exactly what tonight's vote is, our payment on the ransom of the American people. On the House floor, action began with a vote on the rule, setting up how the bill is debated. Republican Tom Cole of Oklahoma presented the rule on the House floor, calling the bill historic. The first year-over-year cut in spending in a debt ceiling bill, the largest precision of appropriated but unspent funds in history, the first real reforms to requirements for SNAP and TANF, which will help lift people out of poverty, and real reforms to the permitting process, which will streamline major infrastructure and energy projects and cut the red tape and, and that are holding them back. Jim McGovern of Massachusetts presented for the Democrats. Republicans spent the last five months trying to destroy everything that we built over the last two years. They have only enacted three laws in five months, and those laws don't do much. The bill we are debating today may become their fourth law, it would be their biggest legislative accomplishment of the year. Think about that. The biggest accomplishment will be ending a crisis that they created. Democrat Teresa Leger Fernandez of New Mexico blasted Republican strategy. Everything in this bill could have been negotiated through the normal process without a debt crisis crisis. Indeed, that's how it's almost always been done, except for in 2011 when the Republicans did this before. Expired. The American gentleman people need to tell the Republicans reserves. Gentleman no from Massachusetts more reserves. The gentleman's time's expired. In the final vote, the rule passed on a vote of 241 to 187, with Democrats providing 52 votes to help Republicans get it over the line. In the evening, the House will hold its final vote, sending the bill to the Senate, where it's expected to pass. And that will be the end of the bizarre, only in America, debt limit battle at least for about 18 months, when the bill's debt limit suspension expires. Democratic leader Jeffries is looking ahead. And as a result of the efforts of the Biden administration, we're going to be able to make sure, here in the House and in the Senate, that America does not default and that our economy does not crash and we will all live to fight another day in fighting for the people. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The Senate awaits House action on the debt ceiling and budget cuts bill. Sagar McGani reports. With top House Republican Kevin McCarthy furiously trying to sway skeptical conservatives, Senate counterpart Mitch McConnell's urging the party to stay together. House Republicans' unity gave them the upper hand. They used it to secure a much-needed step 
in the right direction. Democratic Chief Chuck Schumer is warning Republicans against scuttling the bill. Any needless delay, any last minute brinksmanship at this point would be an unacceptable risk. And says the Senate will move fast when the time comes. Sagar Magani, Washington. Climate justice activists rallied outside Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's Brooklyn apartment opposing the debt ceiling deals provision that permits the Mountain Valley gas pipeline. Dollar 300 mile pipeline would transport natural gas that is drilled in Ohio and Pennsylvania across rugged slopes in the Appalachian Mountains. The project faces more than one legal challenge. In one of them, the Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals revoked a key water permit last month because it said West Virginia's Environmental Protection Agency did not adequately address the pipeline's history of water quality violations. The court noted that at least 46 water quality violations and assessed civil penalties totaling roughly $569,000. An analysis from Oil Change International estimates the project will emit the equivalent of more than 89 million metric tons of carbon, equal to the emissions of 26 coal plants. Massachusetts Democrat Representative Ayanna Presley filed an amendment to strip the provision in the debt ceiling bill that resumes student loan payments. She said on social media that the pause on student loan payments because of the COVID pandemic had been life-changing for families across the country and an essential lifeline for workers and families struggling to make ends meet. Meanwhile, Associated Press correspondent Jennifer King reports that the Congressional Budget Office says the debt ceiling deal includes changes to food aid work requirements that end up costing taxpayers more money. The bill phases in higher age limits for work and training requirements for those who want to receive more than three months of food benefits within a three-year period, raising the age from 49 to 54 by 2025. As part of the compromise with Democrats, the provision will expire five years later and drop back down to 49. But a Congressional Budget Office estimate released late Tuesday says the new rules would reduce SNAP spending by $6.5 billion over 10 years, but exemptions added by Democrats for veterans, the homeless, and others would cost $6.8 billion over the same period. And that's Jennifer King reporting. Whether it's the recent debt ceiling negotiations or the farm bill debate, a key federal food assistance program is again at the mercy of budget haggling. Hunger fighting groups say some of the rhetoric is short-sighted. Mike Moen reports. House Republicans have pushed for expanding work requirements for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps, arguing it would incentivize more recipients to work. But Colleen Moriarty with the group Hunger Solutions feels it would actually do the opposite. She says food insecurity would instantly become a huge barrier in job search efforts. It's like if you want someone to work and you cut off their access to public transportation to get to a job, then they can't get there. If they don't have any food, they're hungry. They can't concentrate on what it is they're doing. A tentative debt ceiling deal was reached over the weekend, and it does include some expanded work requirements for able-bodied adults without dependents, but there are also now exemptions for veterans and those experiencing homelessness. Research has shown most SNAP recipients are part of the labor force, but often deal with interruptions such as health issues and maintaining stable employment. Moriarty says limiting any aspect of SNAP benefits comes at the worst time for those struggling to get by. Her group recently noted food shelves in Minnesota saw nearly 2 million more visits last year. And most pandemic aid has ended, which especially impacts older residents. Just recently, when we lifted the emergency status and SNAP went back to the previous levels, what we've seen is just a dramatic effect on seniors. Their benefits have rolled back now to $23 a month you know, they're scared. This past session, the Minnesota legislature approved $5 million in emergency food shelf aid, but Moriarty warns that as some locations still can't meet demand and SNAP benefits are limited, those in need might not have anywhere to turn to. 
Meanwhile, Congress is expected to vote this week on the debt ceiling proposal that includes the updated SNAP provisions. Mike Moen, Minnesota News Connection. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. I'm Mark Maracle. And once again, a quick reminder that our spring fund drive here at KPFA ended several thousand dollars short of our goal And there are going to be consequences to pay depending on how short the final total is. To make it a little shorter, a little smaller, we're keeping our premiums, our thank you gifts, up online at kpfa.org for the rest of the week and seeking (laughs) donations and contributions from you, our listeners, if you did not make a donation or a gift during the spring drive and can do so now, please go online at kpfa.org and help us reduce this deficit. kpfa.org, go online and you can see our various thank you gifts for your donation. They will be up online there at kpfa.org for the rest of the week. Please help us minimize the damage to the station by our financial shortfall, kpfa.org, kpfa.org. Thank you very much. Former Vice President Mike Pence will officially launch his widely expected campaign for the Republican nomination for president in Iowa next week. That adds another candidate to the growing Republican field, puts Pence in direct competition with his former boss, Donald Trump. Sources say Pence will hold a kickoff event in Des Moines on June 7th, the date of his 64th birthday. Tony Waterman reports. According to reports, Pence will make the announcement in a video message next Wednesday, ahead of a town hall in Iowa. The traditional Republican has tried distancing himself from his former boss, Donald Trump, in recent months, denouncing the January 6 attacks and expressing unwavering support for Ukraine. But the former vice president is treading lightly, hoping to rope in support for moderate Republicans who are tired of the Trump show, but not wanting to alienate the former president's loyal base. Pence will have to fight to win the nomination amid a crowded field of GOP contenders. Polls show him trailing far behind Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Tony Waterman, Texas. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is expected to launch his second campaign for the Republican nomination for president next week in New Hampshire. Christie also sought the GOP nomination in 2016. He dropped out of that race a day after finishing sixth in New Hampshire's primary. Christie has cast himself as the only potential candidate willing to aggressively take on former President Trump, the current front runner for the nomination. Christie, a former federal prosecutor, was a longtime friend and advisor to Trump, but he broke with Trump over Trump's refusal to accept the results of the 2020 presidential election. Christie has since emerged as a leading vocal critic of the former president. The moment Florida governor and newly minted Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis signed a sweeping elections bill into law last week, several voter advocacy groups filed lawsuits against it. Jamel Gomes has that story. Senate Bill 7050 creates a broad set of restrictions for third-party voter registration groups. It cuts the amount of time they have to submit voters' applications and adds new and higher fines for late submissions. S.T. Connor with Demos, a think tank that focuses on racial justice, says her group's lawsuit targets a new provision that bans any non-citizen from getting involved in voter registration work. Connor says it directly impacts groups she represents, such as Hispanic Federation and Poder Latinx, that have a long history of helping people register to vote. And really what this law does is it is an attack on the ability of Floridians, regardless of their immigration status, to participate 
in the democratic process of civic engagement. The bill's sponsor, Republican Representative Lawrence McClure of Dover, said the bill is meant to hold voter registration groups to high standards and protect voters' personal information. Groups like the League of Women Voters and other plaintiffs are also suing, claiming the law is unconstitutional and violates the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Connor says all Floridians, including non-citizens, have the right to participate in the work of building a better democracy. She claims the law is a brazen attempt to shut down voter registration work in those communities. If an organization violates this law in any way, even if they do so by mistake, um, they will be fined $50,000 per person that has violated the law, and there's no limit. The new law also requires those organizations to provide voter registration applicants with a receipt detailing the voters' personal information. According to a study by University of Florida political science professor Daniel Smith, Florida voters of color are five times more likely than white voters in the state to register to vote through third-party civic engagement groups. This is Tremel Gomes for Florida News Connection. According to a grand jury indictment that was unsealed today, a failed political candidate has been indicted on federal charges, including interference with the electoral process in connection with a series of drive-by shootings at the homes of state and local lawmakers in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The indictment filed in U.S. District Court in Albuquerque takes aimed at failed Republican candidate Solomon Pena and two named accomplices with felony charges of interfering with federal protected activities as well as weapons-related counts in connection with the shootings in December of 2022 and January of this year on the homes of four Democratic officials, including the current State House Speaker. The attacks came amid a surge of threats and acts of intimidation against election workers and public officials across the country after former President Donald Trump and his allies spread false claims about the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. The new indictment outlines smartphone communications, including text messages by Pena in the days following the November 8, 2022 election that pinpoint the locations of officials' homes, allege election rigging, call on conspirators to press the attack. Text messages show Pena bristling with outrage as the county commission certified the results of the midterm election and his own overwhelming defeat as a candidate for a seat in the State House of Representatives. Federal charges also filed against Jose Luis Trujillo and Demetrio Trujillo on allegations that they assisted Pena in obtaining vehicles and firearms and that they pulled the trigger themselves to fire bullets into the homes of the victims. Civic groups are taking action against what they call voter suppression tactics in the South. Shantia Hudson has that story. This week, Alabama Values Solve and Groundwork Project joined forces with other organizations to discuss recent legislation such as Alabama House Bill 209. The bill's provisions would forbid individuals from aiding in the distribution, ordering, requesting, collecting, obtaining, or delivering of an absentee ballot application or absentee ballot on behalf of someone else. During the briefing, Dylan Nettles with ACLU Alabama said the bill also criminalizes civic organizations and individuals wanting to assist others in exercising their right to vote by limiting who can help get the ballots or applications. But that is a very narrow group of individuals you essentially have to be someone who works as an election official or works in the absentee election manager's office. You have to be a next of kin of that individual or someone who lives with them. If it passes, HB 209 would establish felony charges for people who break the law. According to Kiana Jackson, the Research and Coalition Organizing Manager at New Disabled South, this bill not only hinders organizations that facilitate voting accessibility, but also creates great hurdles for older adults and individuals with disabilities. We know that about 7.5% of disabled people are not able to have a voter ID compared to able-bodied people is at 4%. So there are a huge gap in even how we vote. But then particularly when we talk about accessibility and you're putting more and more barriers in place 
HB 209 is through the House and awaits action by the State Governmental Affairs Committee. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. For Alabama News Service, I'm Shantia Hudson. The longest ever walkout in the Oregon legislature completed its fourth week today as the enforceability of a ballot measure that would disqualify the boycotters from immediate re-election appeared to be in doubt. By all appearances, Oregon's 2023 legislative session has crashed on the rocks amid the boycott by minority Republicans in the Senate over an abortion and transgender care bill. Senate President Rob Wagner once again tried today to convene the chamber, which last met on May 2nd. But in what's become a Groundhog Day ritual in the past four weeks, Wagner then banged the gavel to close the aborted session. Senator Tim Knopp, leader of the minority Senate Republican, says the boycott will only end on the last day of the legislative session, June 25th, to pass so-called bipartisan legislation and budget bills. Wagner says Democratic priorities, including a sweeping measure to guarantee abortion rights, are not negotiable. Democratic Governor Tina Kotek said today that her talks to end the impasse have failed and that the Republican leader wants the abortion and gender-affirming care bill substantially amended or dead. After Republican lawmakers boycotted the Oregon legislature in 2019, 2020, and 2021, voters last November approved a ballot measure by an almost 70% margin that was supposed to stop walkouts. Lawmakers with 10 or more unexcused absences will be disqualified from being elected in the next term. That was what the measure's title and summary said. But the text of the measure says disqualification applies to the term following the election after the member's current term is completed, and Republicans take that as meaning that boycotters who are up for re-election in 2024 could be candidates since their current term ends in January of 2025. In other words, the disqualification would not come until the 2028 election. An American woman who accused President Joe Biden of sexually assaulting her has flown to Moscow and is seeking Russian citizenship. Tara Reid worked as an assistant to Biden when he was a senator for Delaware. She made headlines in 2020 as Biden's presidential campaign was getting underway when she claimed that he assaulted her in a Capitol Hill corridor when she was 29 years old, accusing Biden of forcing her against a wall and putting his hands under her shirt and skirt. Speaking to a state-run Russian news outlet, Reed, who's now 59 years old, said she felt safe in Russia and wants to stay. Gabriel Fami reports. Tyra Reid gave an interview to Sputnik, a Russian government-run news site. She said her decision to go to Russia was very difficult, but she believed she'd be more safe there and that she was looking to get citizenship. Reid accused President Biden of touching her inappropriately when she worked as a staff assistant in his Senate office in 1993. Biden has flatly denied the allegations. Gabrielle Fami, New York. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story, or an idea, or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA.
Police have arrested three key organizers supporting people protesting Atlanta's proposed police and fire training center, which opponents call Cop City. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation says its agents and Atlanta police today arrested three officers of the group that runs the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. The fund has bailed out protesters and helped them find lawyers. They're charged with money laundering and charity fraud. They are 39-year-old Marlon Scott Kautz of Atlanta, 30-year-old Savannah Patterson of Savannah, 42-year-old Adele McLean of Atlanta. Opponents say it's an extreme provocation to arrest leaders of a bail fund. Georgia's governor, Brian Kemp, says the charged people are part of a criminal organization. More than 40 people have been charged with domestic terrorism in connection with protests over the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, a cause that's garnered international attention since authorities clearing the protesters' camp in South River Forest fatally shot an environmental activist there in January. Amazon workers were to walk out today at the company headquarters in Seattle and other locations across the globe to protest recent layoffs, some 27,000 since November, and a return to office mandate and the company's environmental impact. The lunchtime protest comes a week after the company's annual shareholder meeting and a month after a policy took effect requiring workers to return to the office three days a week. As of last night, more than 1,800 employees had pledged to walk out today with about 870 in Seattle. That's according to Amazon Employees for Climate Justice, a climate change advocacy group founded by Amazon workers. Consumer rights advocates are calling on California State Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara to step in to prevent insurance provider State Farm from no longer offering new homeowner insurance policies to Californians. They're arguing that Prop 103, the 1988 measure that requires insurance commissioner approval for insurance rate hikes, gives the commissioner the authority to intervene. Max Pringle reports. State Farm announced on Friday that it would stop offering new homeowner policies, citing things like climate change caused wildfires and other conditions that made the policies too risky in California. But consumer rights advocates say State Farm's move violates the law. Harvey Rosenfield is founder of Consumer Watchdog and author of Prop 103. State Farm didn't follow the law. It Uh, unilaterally decided to reduce its risk in California in order to, as they acknowledged, improve their financial condition. So that is a violation of Prop 103. In a statement, Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara's office said, quote, the factors driving State Farm's decision are beyond our control, including climate change, reinsurance costs affecting the entire insurance industry, and global inflation, unquote. The statement went on to say that 115 companies in California offer homeowners insurance and State Farm will honor existing policies. R.V. Rosenfield says State Farm's move is calculated as leverage with the state for a request that it has made for $720 million in new premium hikes. Perhaps this is State Farm's way of forcing, of forcing the insurance commissioner to give them the, a rate hike that they may or may not deserve. Rosenfield says State Farm is the largest insurance provider in the state. He said State Farm is using the climate crisis as a way of weakening regulations. They want to be freed of regulation. They want to be freed of the control that the voters put on their prices and their practices. So from my point of view, it's a um, political subterfuge to say that climate change is responsible when, and the truth is that the industry is blaming Proposition 103. Rosenfield said this isn't the first time that the insurance industry has discontinued service when it found conditions in California unfavorable. He said the industry took swift action after the passage of Prop 103 in 1988. Every insurance company pulled out of California. They stopped doing new business. And um, the attorney general subsequently investigated that and found that they, were, that they had colluded 
They conspired among themselves to do that in order to get the state Supreme Court to invalidate Prop 103, which the court did not do. Consumer watchdogs Harvey Rosenfield says it has been four times more profitable for insurance companies to sell homeowners insurance in California than in the rest of the country. So, he says, he doesn't see State Farm staying out of the market for new homeowners insurance business in the state for too long. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. Democratic California Senator Alex Padilla today held his first hearing as chair of the Senate Environment and Public Works Subcommittee on Fisheries, Water, and Wildlife. The hearing focused on rising water rates and how aging infrastructure and extreme weather conditions are impacting the affordability of clean water for American consumers. Padilla said the nation owes it to its citizens, particularly low-income citizens, to beef up its aging infrastructure and prepare it for the challenges that are already coming to the water system from climate change. In a country as wealthy as the United States, nobody should have to worry about whether aging, deteriorating pipes in rural communities will hold up, whether wells could dry, run dry due to an extended drought, or whether the climate crisis and extreme weather will bring catastrophe to our water supply. According to a state audit in 2022, California required an estimated $64.7 billion to upgrade its water infrastructure. In April, the EPA awarded a fraction of that at $391 million. Today's hearing touched on the need for national water assistance and affordability programs, as well as the need for sustained federal water infrastructure investments following the historic water infrastructure investments included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. A new report says investing in the Delta Tunnel Project would financially stress Southern California's Metropolitan Water District, resulting in rate increases and more economic hardship for its water customers. The analysis is by Max Gomberg, a private consultant who has resigned as an advisor to the State Water Board after harshly criticizing the state's approach to water and climate change. The report was sponsored by the California Water Impact Network, which held a media briefing with Gomberg earlier this month. Vic Bedoyan reports from Fresno. The Metropolitan Water District of Southern California is a sprawling agency serving nearly 20 million customers. It's basically in the water marketing business. To get more water for growth, the Met has long supported building a Delta conveyance tunnel, a single tunnel 40 miles long under the Bay Delta. The Met says it's for a more reliable water supply. A final decision has yet to be made, but Max Gomberg is out to prove that the tunnel is not worth its share of the estimated $16 billion price tag. The water costs for Met and its member agencies are, are rising steeply for uh, various reasons, uh, again, having to do with these investments, basic inflationary pressures, uh, workforce issues, and, and beyond. And so... This is, this is a critical decision point because if MET agrees to take on the debt for, for its portion of this project, that is going to really impact the, the cost of water and ultimately ratepayer bills, uh, which are already, again, unaffordable for a lot of people in this state and, and within MET's service area. Gomberg's analysis also foresees climate change as a risk factor in future water supplies. Major sources are Northern California watersheds, the eastern Sierra's Owens Valley, and the Colorado River. All are subject to climate whiplash, and he contends all those sources could be anything but reliable in the coming years. MET is also at a place where it really needs to reevaluate its, its business model, which has been, for its existence, essentially raising revenue through doing what it does, which is being a wholesaler of wa water imported from elsewhere. And, and the, the vast majority of Met's revenue stream is still made up of water sales. And as those water sales decline, that is going to put uh, an increasing strain on Met's budget and create a, a, a set of difficult economic decisions about whether to try to increase revenues by increasing prices. 
diversify the revenue stream, cut expenses, but something has to give. The Met's position is that the tunnel is designed to mitigate climate change impacts. They say the proposed Delta Conveyance Project would increase California's ability to capture Sierra stormwater when it's available and when diversions don't harm sensitive fish, and that that would help replenish groundwater basins and reservoirs. So would the Metropolitan Water District pull the plug on its tunnel investment? Gomberg isn't certain, but he thinks there could be a chance. I think the current uh, leadership of Met from the general manager um, and and his sort of top team, I think they're interested in pursuing uh, change. I, I, you know, whether there's going to be full support for that, um, whether there's going to be full support for backing away from the tunnel from their board uh, remains to be seen. I don't have any uh, particular insight into that. Max Gomberg's assessment concludes that Southern California will need to keep importing water and has the capacity to build resilience to climate change. But it needs an approach that is more equitable and environmentally sound, like increasing local water sources with recycling and conservation. And he warns, in pursuing the tunnel project, the Met and the people it serves could face an unsustainable and more costly future. Vic Bedoyan reporting for KPFA News and KFCF Radio. The U.S. government's auto safety agency is going to mandate that all new passenger cars and light trucks include automatic emergency braking systems and meet stricter safety standards within three years. Although the number of people killed on U.S. roadways declined slightly last year, the agency said that the 42,795 who did die still represented a national crisis. The agency says the new mandated technology will dramatically reduce rear-end crashes, saving what it estimates will be at least 360 lives a year. will also cut injuries by at least 24,000 annually. Ed Donahue reports from Washington. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration wants to require all new passenger cars and light trucks include potentially life-saving automatic emergency braking and meet stricter safety standards within three years. This is another step toward regulating electronic systems responsible for what drivers usually do on their own. NHTSA Chief Counsel Ann Carlson says they want brakes to be effective at much higher speeds. We're also including what we call full collision avoidance. That means that a vehicle has to stop without touching another vehicle in front of it. The systems would allow vehicles to fully avoid other vehicles at up to 50 miles per hour if a driver doesn't react. With this proposal, we could change a high-speed crash from a deadly one to a lower speed crash with minor injuries or just property damage. NHTSA says 90% of new passenger vehicles already include the braking technology. Ed Donahue, Washington. We have had a couple of donations from KPFA listeners to help us make up the gap, the shortfall between what we were trying to raise during our just completed spring fund drive here at KPFA and what we need to continue to broadcast at the levels that we are currently broadcasting. Thanks to donors in Palo Alto and in Berkeley. And if you can help us with that shortfall, if you can help us reduce that deficit, please go online, kpfa.org, online at kpfa.org. All of our thank you gifts, all of our premiums are online at kpfa.org for the rest of the week. And we hope that uh, if you didn't make a donation previously, you can do so before the week is up. KPFA.org. Partly cloudy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the mid-60s around the bay. Sunny inland with highs near 80 degrees. Sunny as well in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the upper 80s. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, May 31st. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. KPFA is on social media. Follow us on your favorite platforms for news headlines, live stream events, show info, and more. That's at KPFA 94.1 on Facebook and at KPFA Radio on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 